We are going to start with uh, Roberta Schaefer, who is the Law Librarian of Congress. Uh, she is a former Fulbright Scholar in the Law in Israel. Um, she was Dean of the School of Library Science at the University of Texas. Uh, she's worked as a corporate li law librarian at Covington and Burlington. Um, a long record of public service, including running the FedLink program, which is what gives access to information services uh, to the rest of government. So, Roberta, thank you so much for being here. Um, make sure you hit the little button that turns green when you're ready to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I'm green now, so that's always a good sign in today's times. Um, thank you, Carl, and uh, good morning, everyone. I don't know that I'm compelled to give my normal disclaimer this morning about the fact that what I'm going to say today uh, reflects my opinions, but um, I want to because I want you to understand something at the, uh, at the outset about how decisions are being made regarding uh, sharing of information and access to it at the Library of Congress. So I want you to understand that within the institution, we don't have singular decision makers. What happens at LC, and that's what we call ourselves, uh, is that we make group decisions, and the decisions that are being made today about how information is being handled, preserved, distributed, accessed, organized, all of that is being done in a very uh, collective way. And we have, uh, for example, something called the Web Governance Board, which looks at content, and we also have something called the um, Information Technology Review Board, which looks at how we invest our resources in information technology it tends to look more at the infrastructure than it does the content, which is more the purview of the um, Web Governance Board. We're also very active in something, and I, my staff who are here know that I don't like to miss an opportunity to say the name because you know how fabulous acronyms can be in the federal government, and this one is among my favorites. It's FUDGE. And um, every time I say it or think about their conv conv convening, I always sort of find my mouth starts to water and I think, mm, that sounds like the best pasta dish. But anyway, it really isn't a pasta dish, although like many pasta dishes, it brings together diverse ingredients to come together and collaboratively make a wonderful end product. But FAGI is the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative. And if anyone's interested at the end, we can share their um, website with you. So looking um, at Carl's title, uh, just like um, Dan Lundgren did, I was fascinated by it. And particularly the prominence of the word democracy, because it made me think back to the Greeks. And as many of you know, one of the guiding principles of Athenian society was that good citizens had to have access to the law as a parenthetical one of the things that was also a guiding principle of Athenian society was that good citizens needed to be literate. And universal literacy was a key component of Athenian society. If we fast forward a little bit and look at Roman society, the Justinian codes in many, many ways were motivated by the emperor's opinion that if he was going to tax his citizens, and also encourage them to engage in trade with his colonies, that he needed to let them know beforehand the kind of trade that would be encouraged and the kinds of tariffs and taxes that he would be imposing on that trade. So again, access to information, legal information. And then Dan Lundgren mentioned the Magna Carta, so let me not be uh, uh, give short shrift to that document. In fact, just to show you that he didn't inspire me, but a recent article in the New York Times did, I was fascinated to reflect that, in fact, Carl, your origins are in the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta ca uh, came about because the barons were concerned that the king was promising to do lots of things, but then when push came to shove, quite literally, push came to shove, the, um, the barons found that he wouldn't be doing what he said he did. So they gathered, they, they said to him, okay, John, let's meet here and let's get this straight. We have to know when you're holding the trials. We have to be able to uh, not be held uh, against our will. And we are going to demand that you put it in writing 
and then that copies are made so that everybody can know about it. It backfired a little bit, and as we know, he tried several times to revoke it, but it backfired a little bit because then those people over whom the barons had authority said, hey, what about us? And the happy result is the Declaration of Independence, the US Constitution, and myriad constitutions that have followed our example through the two plus centuries. Now let's talk about the birth of America and how libraries and law come together. Benjamin Franklin, the father of American intervention, excuse me, invention, <laughs> invented something that we hold very dear as a guiding principle of American society, and that is the concept of a free public library. And one of the key reasons that he believed so strongly in a free public library related to the fact that he believed if you could know about scientific invention, it would help to create innovation. And he saw as a key principle of America that we would need to be an innovative country. And I'm happy to say that that has followed through as a theme throughout our history. So access to laws, what do we know? Good citizenship, understanding your rights and responsibilities, and I guess when you'll be taxed and when you won't be, still very, very true today. And last but not least, access to the laws as a way to inspire innovation in a society. Excellent motivations for providing law to the people. So what we look at at the Library of Congress as our principles of providing access to law are basically what we call the four A's of legal information. And many of you who've attended law school hear about this when you are in law school. And they relate to the concept of authentication, authoritativeness, accuracy, and access. And it is, in fact, those four A's that guide the principles that the Library of Congress follows today. But as we all can appreciate, we don't have to be technologists or lawyers to know that technology creates both enormous opportunity, but it also creates some kind of frightening things that can happen as a result of the wrong people having access to information on a very large scale, coupled with our incredible ability to share information so that very frightening things can happen very quickly and without any warning. And we need to be sure, as we, the stewards of information, make policy that we do nothing that will create the negative, that will create evil or something that cannot be quickly controlled or contained. And those are the challenges that I think we face today. So how does the Library of Congress deal with all of these challenges, all of the four A's? Well, the first is that within our collecting principles, we collect materials in their best format. And when we think about the best format, some people are lucky. They only need to live in one time zone, in one time frame. The Library of Congress, we actually live in three time frames. We're like the ultimate time travelers, I think. And that is because we need to be concerned about information from the past. Naturally, we need to be concerned about information in the present. But last but not least, we need to worry about information in the future. And that means that we need to be able to assure what we are collecting today and thinking has value today for tomorrow will in fact be here tomorrow. And in the technological age, that is not always the easiest challenge. Do I have to admit that I do have floppy disks in my attic? I do. I know that they have important information about my life and my work product, and God love them, I'll never get that information again. <laughs> The next thing we do is that we are setting standards for preservation, and that in many ways relates to that great FUDGE group that we participate in. We're working with 
a variety of federal agencies across agencies, looking at the different challenges that will face them, because ultimately, that information will need to be maintained by, few of, by a few of us, NARA, GPO, and the Library of Congress. And we want to make sure that we're looking at life cycle at birth, not midlife and not at death. Because if we look at life cycle at birth, we have a better chance of assuring that this information will live and be available to the public for as long as possible. We're looking uh, and asking members of Congress and their staffs, what are the kinds of information that your constituents are looking for from you? We're doing this by collecting information from staff, and we're also looking at the kinds of information that they're asking us for. We're not looking at the distinct micro of the information, but we're looking at it in a macro way so that we can build our enormous Thomas database in a way that reflects the needs of people who we call concerned and curious citizens, who tend to be the ones who actually are looking for information from us. And then we're trying to keep abreast of what other countries are doing particularly in the authentication area. We're fascinated to be watching this whole concept of document DNA. And what that document DNA means is that no matter how information is repurposed, if you click on any bit of that information in someone else's document where it's been repurposed or reused or recycled, you can still know the origin of that information. So the authentication challenge, be it uh, potentially changed because of misfeasance, malfeasance, or plain old mischief, with document DNA, we don't have to worry because someone will always be able to know the original source of that information. And then finally, we're using various social media techniques and our uh, person who's in charge of that is in the audience today, should you ask questions about that. We're, we're trying to expose more people to information. And this is in incredibly helpful. Now, I don't know if Elena Kagan uh, is happy about the Library of Congress collection this morning. As many of you noticed, her transcript from Harvard was accessible because we have organized Thurgood Marshall's papers and because she applied for a job, also known as a law clerk, to Thurgood Marshall, her Harvard transcript is part of our collection. So now everybody knows that Elena got a B minus in criminal law the first year of law school. <laughs> but in any event, our focus continues to be on content and on the ability of the American people to come to this phenomenal collection, this national asset, called the Library of Congress, and marry together not only government information, not only US government information, but government information from over 220 jurisdictions worldwide with manuscripts, with maps, with anything at all that might spark their curiosity and their innovation. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, Roberta. Next time I see Faji Alfredo on a menu, I will make sure to um, order that. Um. <laughs> With pesto sauce. With pesto sauce, yes.